The Maris Brothers are a religious congregation of men that were founded to work in schools, primarily as educators. We work with young people on their own spiritual journeys. Part of being a, a Maris Brother today is really being open to journeying and talking to young people about how is God present in their lives. We were founded in rural France with a mission to spread the gospel to young people, especially those that need us in, in ways that are being neglected by so many people in society as a whole. Today we continue that mission through our work primarily in education, through secondary schools, junior high schools, and parish work as well. It's an opportunity to meet the needs of young people, but actually in this process, they meet our needs as well. We hope to evangelize them, but in the process, we're evangelized at the same time. What it means to be a Maris brother, I think today it means three things. I mean, it means to be men of prayer, men of service, and men of community. And the prayer part, I think, is, is that we have our own spirituality, but we also have a group spirituality. We, we pray as a group. We, we, and I think that that's, that's the foundation of, of what we do. I joined the Maris Brothers right after high school. I was 18 years of age. I think it had an appeal. Uh, I was intrigued. I was interested. Uh, my friend said it would never work out. You'll be home before you know it. When I entered, I said, I'm going to give it everything I possibly could. Uh, it's like the gospel story. You don't put your hand to the plow and then look back. Because if you do, then you're never really with it. It was kind of this, this little tug that I felt that I resisted. I didn't really want to start out to be a celibate man. I, I really thought I would be married and, and have a family. I went to third year abroad in my junior year. I spent my year at the University of Madrid, and I thought, well, this is great. You know, I'm away from everything, and I'm away from all that influence, and, and I'll just have a great time. And I traveled all around Europe a lot, and I really had a, a, a wonderful experience there. But what I noticed was that the tug became even more of, uh, more urgent, you know, it was, uh, it didn't stop. And I thought, well, I'm away from all this stuff. I'll just forget about all this. And, and that didn't happen. It was just there. I had joined the Maris Brothers in 91. I was assigned to teach in the school. But in those two years that I was in school, I began to ask a lot of questions. Part of me entered the Maris Brothers right out of college. Um, there were life questions that I wanted to answer. If, if I can make it on my own, I want to live on my own, experience life in different ways. Um, I wanted to be in a relationship and possibly start a family. Um, and that, and because of those reasons and those questions that surfaced, I needed to take a step out and look at that. And while I was away, I was in a relationship with a woman and I experienced new things, but I also felt that I was being called back um, to religious life and the Maris Brothers. And she herself was, had a sense of call. And the funny part of my story is that we are both in religious life now. She's a, a sister and I'm a brother. The mission of, of Father Chapani, which Maris Brothers throughout the world really try to actualize today, and there are over 5,000 Maris Brothers in over 74 countries around the world, is really to address the needs of young people, especially poor young people and children who need education, who need to know fundamentally who God is and who Jesus is. And that's really the focus of the life of a Maris brother. I get a request to consider going to Rwanda. Now this is 1995, right after the genocide. And I thought, oh my gosh, they must be crazy. Am I not doing a good job here that they want to put me on the front lines and uh, get rid of me or something? So here I am thrown into the, the middle of this trying to teach English and religion full schedule. It's probably the best apostolate job that I have ever done because it has had such a long lasting effect on, on the students that I taught, many of whom are in this country getting further education, the people who are still there in Rwanda, and what it's done for me to open my mind to life outside of the United States. I created 
what I call an adventure-based retreat program. It's very similar to what Outward Bound does or Project Adventure does, those types of, of things. But I use Christian metaphors for each of the different activities and have developed it into a whole retreat experience for students. I hope that kids get a sense of God in the everyday. A big part of the program is working together and having an opportunity to see God in each other, to figure out how does God work through me to help other people? How does God work through other people to help me? I started my teaching career at a, a high school in Queens, and then I went to Newark, New Jersey, in the Central Ward of Newark, to a school that was 100% African American. One of the things that I think a lot of times white teachers are a little hesitant to address with kids is the whole issue of slavery, because, you know, um, well, in my case, it was all minority kids. So, you know, how do I as a white man teach this? And, um, you know, I, I just believe in you teach it and you, you talk about it. And, and um, I, I really, I think as a result of listening to kids and, and dealing with kids who, who don't look like me, um, I've, I've learned to view the world maybe through a different lens. I remember teaching there and saying, didn't African-American people have to be strong to withstand the whole issue of slavery. Didn't they have to be smart? Didn't they have to learn how to read in secret? And didn't they have to learn how to uh, maintain their own culture? And, you know, as we talked and, and we, would, we would grapple with some of these things and uh, oftentimes the kids would say, well, you know, the white people. And I, and I remember thinking, I'm white, you know. Like. Anyway, I, I learned an awful lot about cross-cultural stuff and, you know, color and race and all that stuff. It, it matters because it's who we are, but it's not what we are. I think a life choice is something that you never feel immediately at peace with. I think a life choice that really has depth and meaning is one that uh, you grow into, that you have the challenges, you have the high points, the low points, the wonderful opportunities of affirmation, but it's the choices that make you really come to terms with who you are, what your call is, what the meaning of life is all about. It really is a question of what do you want to give your life for, you know? Um, at the end of the day, when, when people say, well, what did he do with his life? Now, I, th I can't think, really, because of, of the experiences that I've had and because of the, the influences on me um, as a result of the work that I've done, you know, I, I really can't think of anything that's more noble. There is no certainty in any choice. Every choice has a risk. And if it didn't have a risk, it wouldn't be a worthwhile choice. As I look back at 40 years of being a Marist brother, I wouldn't say I never had questions or never had doubts. It wouldn't be real. But I've had one of the happiest lives that anybody could possibly want. I've lived consistently with positive, good, prayerful people who've encouraged me to be the best type of individual I could be. I really believe it's a choice that is worth examining. It may not be for everybody. Uh, it's a choice that demands great things, but it's a choice that gives so much back in return. <laughs>